Sore tendons is inevitable when it comes to climbing because let's face it, we love climbing and when you don't have the pain sensors that tell you to stop climbing, it can be difficult to stop climbing. <laughs> For me, it was waking up in the morning and noticing that it was difficult to hold a mug of coffee and that when I pinched my A2 tendon on my ring finger, it was painful, it, it was sore. Luckily, this was pre-injury or micro-injury, so it didn't stop me from climbing, but there are definitely things that I needed to do to recover. And in this video, we go through an interview with Eric Horst. He's the author of Training for Climbing and you probably know him from his YouTube channel or from many other thought leadership that he's done regarding the subject because he really is a leading spokesperson in this space. This is actually part two of a three-part series. In part one, we talked about the science behind your tendons when it comes to climbing. In this one, we're talking about what you can do physically to recover and then stay tuned for part three where we're going to talk about what you can do nutrition-wise. So let's first talk about the exercise side of things, and then we'll go to the nutrition because I view, you know, kind of training and then nutrition as opposite sides of the same coin. You know, if you really want to do your best and, you know, improve at climbing and hopefully dodge injury, um, you need to be doing both of them um, pretty smartly. Uh, and so when it comes to training, of course, it's all about the appropriate dose. Uh, and, you know, so uh, climbers who just, you know, um, go overboard, uh, whether it's days in the gym or reps on a hangboard or, you know, just too much too soon. You know, it takes years to build the capacity to, to train like that or to train at a high level. So uh, a climber of two years shouldn't try to train like a climber they see at the gym of 10 years. You know, it's apples and oranges. It, you know, it will get them injured in most cases if they try to model after somebody else. They need to find a coach or self-coach and be on an appropriate program for them. Um, and in terms of rigorous training or rigorous climbing, uh, like where you're really hanging on your fingers hard or pulling hard, um, I think three to four days a week is really the limit. Uh, you know, people that go to the gym seven days a week, you know, and you go to the gym and you say, oh, I'm going to do an easy day. Well, e that easy day often escalates into something, you know, that's a lot more rigorous. Um, and, and so, you know, it really takes some discipline and hopefully keeping track of your, your workouts and what the intensity is. And, you know, the high intensity days, maybe just two or three a week, and then maybe there's a, a fourth lower intensity day. Um, and then you need some rest days where you're not like tugging on your fingers hard and you're not, you can do other types of training. You can run, you could do some antagonist training but you wouldn't want to do anything really highly targeted or rigorous on the climbing muscles on the rest days. Um, so, so those really true training days need to be limited and need to be smartly invested. Now, you mentioned something I like, and it's something I've been trying to communicate in recent years, is total rest isn't the best thing for tendons and ligaments, um, except for the, the case of an acute injury you get one of those ruptures or you have an acute injury in your shoulder or elbow, there needs to be uh, a complete withdrawal from training and climbing during that acute stage where you kind of want to assess the situation, possibly see a doctor, um, maybe ice the injury the first day or two. So there needs to be at least a brief withdrawal from climbing. You don't want to climb through an acute injury, but for an uninjured climber, someone like you or me, hopefully right now, um, you know, we're doing our three focus days of climbing training and at the gym or climbing outside. But then those other rest days, you can do some loading of your tendons. You talked about doing a squeeze device. Now, it wouldn't be one of those strongman devices where you're, ah, you know, squeezing at 100%. I'm talking about like, one of those rubber balls or donuts that is very easy to squeeze, doing or even a tennis ball that is easy to squeeze. Um, or if you have a hangboard in your house, hanging on the biggest holds um, or the middle size holds that go, you know, full two pads deep, doing a few hangs like that, um, doing some obvious, you know, some forearm stretching. Uh, doing those types of activities every day is fine and actually good because, because the connective tissues have poor blood flow, they actually get their nutrition during the loading. Um, think of how a sponge, you put a sponge into a bucket of water and you squeeze it and let go. And if you do that, the fluid is moving in and out of the sponge. 
Well, in a very subtle way, that is what is happening in our tendons and ligaments. They are bathed in synovial fluid. Um, and so when you load the tendons, it could be the tendons in your fingers. It could be your ACL and your knee when you go running. When they're being loaded, there is like that sponge fluid moving in and out of them. And that's how they get their nutrition. And so if on your rest days, you do nothing but sit at a computer, that's not enough loading to really, you know, get that sponge effect, if you want to call it that. But if you did some donut squeezing, or you did some easy hangboarding, or a few pull-ups, uh, or some rotator cuff training, that would be great to do on a rest day as long as it doesn't escalate. Again, if it turns into a hangboard workout where you're grabbing small holds, well, then you're into that heavy loading again. And so it takes discipline. And so I call these very light, brief workouts protective sessions. Uh, I've done a couple of videos on it uh, to really promote it because it's an important concept and very valuable because by doing that daily loading, you can actually accelerate the recovery and the rate of, uh, of remodeling or even healing of a tweaked tendon or ligament. That's all I have to say. Speechless. A uh, fantastic interview. Thank you so much, Eric, for walking us through that. If you like this video, you'll probably like the next one in its series. It's all about the nutrition behind tendons so that you can recover your tendons from what you eat, including something that's super important when it comes to the science of tendons. If you watched part one in this series, collagen.